Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, camera's rolling. Tonight we're going to do chapter four. Marketing management, marketing research essentials. This is something that is touched upon in Principles of Marketing, slightly more expanded here, and is its own course later on in your marketing careers. So tonight we're going to describe the difference between market information systems and market research systems, identify how critical internal inside the firm information is collected and used in making marketing decisions, explain essential external outside the firm information collection methods, recognize the value of marketing research, which is so important, without it you can't really make any good decisions, um, define the market research process, illustrate current research technologies and how they are used in marketing research. Making good marketing decisions, the need to know. Information is power. The right information at the right time and in the right format is essential for decision making. Creating procedures that collect, analyze, and access, and assess, I'm sorry, and access information is critical. A significant problem for most managers today is not having too little information, but having too much information. In other words, there's information overload. There's way too much information to process, and cognitively it's impossible to wrap your heads around all that information. So marketing managers need a system to design and execute research that generates precise information. There are two fundamental types of marketing information needed today related to broad areas of interest and addressing a specific area of interest. So your broad area of interest will be something like your demographics, understanding who are the people that you need to touch, to to reach exactly. Um, you have to understand the economic trends and the customer or order fulfillment process inside the company. You have to truly be intimate with that and understand if it's working well, what the issues are. So these data are used in strategic planning to help forecast potential new opportunities for company investment or deal with possible problems before they become a major issue for the company. The second type of information needed addresses a specific question. What is the best kitchen design for a retired baby boomer couple, for example? For that, you need to have marketing research that helps you understand that. And marketing research really explains the consumer behavior. And the consumer behavior, aspects of the consumer behavior are, are integral to a marketing manager because if they don't understand the combination of the marketing research and how it explains the behavior, they can't properly plan for success in marketing. Slide five, a marketing information system, otherwise known as MIS, is not a software package necessarily, although it is software, but a continuing process. It's more of a process of identifying, collecting, analyzing, accumulating, and dispensing critical information to marketing decision makers. The nature of the marketing information system, what information should be collected by the system is a question you need to consider. What are the information needs of each decision maker? And how does the system maintain the privacy and confidentiality of sensitive information? Google was roasted for this a couple of years ago for selling information. And as you know, you get these robocalls. Anybody here get robocalls from uh, telemarketers on their cell phone? All the time. How do you think they got your number? Oh, uh, I don't know. I came to a point that I actually ignored a professor because I thought it was a robocall. Ah, uh, robo professor robo from like Connecticut. <laughs> so you thought it's you thought somebody was selling you solar panels, huh? Yeah. Basically. Okay. Sure. Or or somebody pretending to be the IRS telling you to go to CVS and get some uh, Apple uh, Apple gift cards. Okay, that happened. I actually just had that they were trying to reach me for my car. And I thought it was fake, because why would they try reaching me, the company? And they actually sent me a letter, because I never answered them. Well, well, like, well so oh. that's, it. that's what happens. Real companies send letters. That's the truth. Okay, so think about all the ways a company gets competitor data. Salespeople and customers uh, in the field, competitor, mater competitor materials and websites, and business-related websites such as, um, such as Hoover's and many others. Because there are so many sources of information, Decisions must be made about what information will be collected and where it will come from and what information will be discarded. So you need to have people in place that know how to sift through this information. And of course, like a CEO probably doesn't need to see the daily sales figures in a company. Um, rather look at, you know, rather look at the, the general 
process of what needs to be done to expand the organization. Your local sales manager needs to know the information about sales. The CEO doesn't. The general in the army doesn't need to know the specifics of how somebody is learning how to shoot a rifle. That's not his business. Of course, he wants his, his men to be competent, but that's the job of the lower echelon people. Company databases hold a great deal of conf confidential data on the customers, suppliers, and employees. By limiting access to data to those with a need to know, companies protect relationships and, of course, build trust. And an example of a company that is very tight looked is Apple. Even in its own inner inner sanctum, they, they really only give the information that you need to know. And it's uh, for that reason that their products are so, um, you know, secretive and people don't find out about it till last minute. Internal sources, collecting information inside the company. Information is used to identify the problem. And what I mean by problem is the thing that you're trying to research, the thing that, you know, the, the, the piece of information you're trying to figure out. Information is used to proactively address issues before they become a problem. So, so important. Here you have, I'm gonna expand this for a second just so you can see it more, more easily. Internal information sources, customer relationship management software, which helps you understand your customer. It's like a profile. Operation documents, customer orders, get to look at trends. Marketing documents and databases, customer inquiries. Salespeople generated data, salespeople information system, what they put in. Management documents, marketing plans, for example. And customer payments, financial documents and databases. You get to see how fast your customers pay. Are they withholding payments? Are they angry about something? From the customer's order to order fulfillment, identify the frequency and the size of customer orders. That's important to determine the actual cost of a customer order. Many years ago, I was in between jobs, and I worked as a salesman for a plumbing uh, company. They sold plumbing fittings, large ones. So there was a certain company that my boss was salivating to get because they were building the World Trade Center, I mean, the Freedom Towers at the time. And he wanted to get in. So... I took a trip down there. It was a little bit scary. The owner was a, let's just say, scary kind of guy. But thank God I was able to, you know, get them to order from us. My boss was so happy. But, you know, in the beginning, he took any order, even if it was small, and literally would Uber it over. I was, I was his Uber. I'd drive it over. And we're talking about a few, you know, a few thousand dollars worth of stuff. Eventually, he got really upset because he knew that he was just using us to to fill his small orders. And he called the guy up and he said, listen, if you want us to, you want us to drop off little things, go to our comp competitors. We deliver truckloads of stuff. You want, you want stuff, we'll send you one truckload, two truckloads. We have union drivers, we'll meet you there. Whatever you want, but it's not worth our while to constantly service you for your small needs. And you have to make sure through this data that you truly understand what your customer is all about, his or her purchasing um, frequency, what they purchase, how fast they pay, because money that's out there, if you have money out there for, let's say, 90 to 100 days, that money's gone. Even if you get the money back within the year, you know, you're giving out free money, and that's wrong. So also rank customers based on established criteria like profitability and calculate the efficiency of the company's production and distribution systems, which is so, so important, because without that, you basically run the risk of not knowing what's going on. The tracking customer orders makes it possible to assess many of the company's critical functions and to see if there's any issues with logistics, for example. Heard on the street, sales information systems, formal systems for collecting data, getting the data, interpretation of data, which is analysis and distribution of data, getting the analysis to the decision makers and back in the field. Salespeople write call reports. This includes products discussed with the customers on a call, customer concerns and changes in personnel. Interpreting the data may be done by managers who add additional insight to the raw data from the salespeople because everybody has a piece of the puzzle and that's why it's so important to have an inclusive environment within the organization. In more sophisticated sales information systems, people at regional or national offices will analyze data from many salespeople looking for broad trends. So again, the more information you get, the broader the trends that you can glean from the database. Distribution of data, getting the analysis to the to decision makers and back into the field so that those decisions can be made and things can be deployed and changed as needed. A sales information system needs to distribute the information to management as part of a larger market information system. 
At the same time, it's important to get the information back out to the sales force so they can have the most up-to-date information at their hands, at their fingertips. When trends, problems, or solutions to problems and opportunities are identified, salespeople benefit from learning quickly so they can respond in the field. Much of the information is a time value, like, you know, figuring out if there's a recall. If there's a recall, the salespeople complain about certain quality issues, and there's a recall, they need to be able to transmit that information directly to the customers, explain to them what the recall is, um, and when they can expect their devices, cars, whatever is affected, to be fixed properly. And the sooner you get that information out, the more transparency there is, the more a company is trusted. External sources collecting information outside the company. Most companies engage, um, sorry, most companies engage in collecting, analyzing, and sorting data for, from the macro environment, and from the greater external environment outside the organization on a continuous basis, known as marketing intelligence, similar to spying. It's not really spying, it's just knowing what's going on outside the organization. Let me just expand this slide here, Exhibit 4.3, external forces affect marketing decisions. They can be political, technological, they can be demographic, by looking at ethnic groups, population of interest, and geographic changes. For example, you know, the movement of the elderly to, to, to certain states during the winter months, snowbirding. Um, in the external forces, we look at economic conditions, of course, the natural world around us, natural disasters and things like that. And of course, very important competition. And we spoke at great length about competition last week. And we spoke about Porter's five forces. Here are some external sources, demographic, economic, technological transformations, competition, political, and legal, and of course, the natural world. The importance of marketing research to managers, good marketing research follows a well-defined set of activities and does not happen by accident. It is planned. It enhances the validity of the information. Information must be valid. In order to validate that information, you need to have the numbers to explain, the, to explain what, what you have found, and it has to be impartial and objective. You don't want to a priori or as decide already beforehand what you want the marketing research to show and then look for indicators to make it you know, accepted to everyone else out there. You don't want that. You want honest information. And in a sense, if you look at the failure of uh, New Coke, they did not properly test it. And I think, I suspect that the people up on top were so hot on the idea that they didn't really um, care so much about the results. They just wanted to promote whatever they wanted to promote and just use everything else for cover. There's definitely some of that that went on. So, as I mentioned, it follows a well-defined set of activities and does not happen by accident. Rather, it comes as a result of methodical identification, collection, analysis, and distribution of data. It enhances the validity of the information. Anyone can get Google, and anyone can go to Google. A topic uh, can come up with a lot of information. However, following the marketing research process enhances the confidence that the researchers will discover, then solve marketing problems and opportunities. So you can't just Google the solution. Although, don't get me wrong, Google is very valuable. We use it every day. We all do. But it is not the end all and end of end all. Uh, has to be impartial and objective. It does not prejudge the information or develop answers to fit an already decided outcome, which is known as a priori reasoning. A priori means that you've already come to that conclusion. Okay? To fit an already decided outcome, rather, it enhances good decision making. It doesn't replace decision making with already preconceived notions. Here is the marketing research process expanded. To find the research problem, understand what you're trying to research, establish the research design, search for secondary sources outside the organization, uh, sorry, in the organization. Secondary sources are good because they're cheap. Primary is stuff that you've actually paid money for to figure out that specific problem. So we're going to talk about focus groups and all kinds of other interviews which are exp expensive. Collection of data, analyze the data, and of course report the findings back to your people so that you know they know how to develop the product the pro the product. Here's another slide, slide number 16, the marketing research process define the research problem. Define the problem, management research deliverables, what do managers want to do with the information. So here's an example, you look at the picture here. Um, just, just looking at this, you have a female biker, which is I'm not trying to be chauvinistic in any way, but the stereotypical view of bikers 
is this big, tough guy with a leather jacket and tattoos all over and, you know, one of those Nazi helmets with a skull on it, and, you know, with studs on his leather jacket, flowing beard. That, unfortunately, is not the case. There are women who don't, don't look for that look. You see that picture over there of a woman. She's dressed in her jeans and feels very comfortable, but she doesn't... I don't see any tattoos or any piercings, anything strange. She looks like a clean-cut clean cut person who likes to drive. And what is she driving in this picture? It looks like a Harley or something like a Harley. So you have people that don't fit the mold. They're predefined. Okay, biker biker girl. No, there are different things you need to research. You have to understand who would want to be a biker. Not your typical uh, person, but your atypical person. This woman may be a woman. Why? Well, go ahead. Maybe they're trying. They know that the big burly guys want to buy the motorcycles. Maybe they're trying to show that you know somebody a little more tame could also drive a motorcycle. Exactly. That is the is the exact point. But in order to say, in order to break the stereotype, you need to do the marketing research and understand who'd want to do it. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, one of my hobbies is I play electric guitar, and people have this. Um, stereotype of electric guitar, long hair, you know, but, or, you know, if he's doing a job in a cultivated, you know, in a fancy, you know, a Jewish wedding, let's say, or any other wedding, fancy wedding, you know, he has to wear his tuxedo, so he has his hair in a bun, but, you know, your typical, this, you know, I, I mean, I've gone up and played a couple of weddings, and like the sound guy looked at me like, hey, you're, you're, you're Orthodox Jew, you're Black Hatter, you're not supposed to do stuff like that. Again, that's a stereotype. And you have to understand the purpose of marketing research is to debunk those stereotypes and to really get down to the core and say, yes, traditionally people like this don't usually go for this kind of activity. But clearly from this picture, you see this girl, this woman, uh, actually a woman, imagine she looks like she's late 20s, you know, early 30s, and she's got her biker gear on. Uh, but she's not too geared up either. She doesn't have the leather jacket. She's not wearing spikes on her shoulders. Doesn't have a pit bull or some Rockweiler, you know, sitting in the back of the uh, of the motorcycle. And that's because this is an atypical person. And the marketing research obviously led whatever brand motorcycle. Let's assume it's a Harley or a Honda or something like that. To realize that that's not your typical um, kind of situation. And that's good because then you expand. I don't your think markets. you need a leather jacket to go on a motorcycle. <laughs> no, I know you don't, but it, it's a. But I mean, it, I I go I I go on a motorcycle. I don't wear leather jackets. My father drives one, so like he gives me rides. He doesn't need to wear leather jackets. So that's atypical, you see, and that's the point. Your typical biker person is gonna look like a Hell's Angels kind of guy, or he's gonna drive a typical, you know, chopper style Harley. You know, the choppers are the ones where you have the handlebars out like this, and the guy drives like this, kills his back. Um, so you see there's a lot of atypical people. Like your dad is not your typical biker dude. You got on his bike, uh, on his motorcycle, so you're not a biker woman. You like going on the bike because it's cool. It's an interesting feeling, you know. You have the hair, your hair flying out there with the wind, the wind in your face. A lot of people would enjoy that. You don't have to be this burly biker to enjoy those things. And the same is true with a lot of different things. For example, sports apparel. If you've looked at any merchandise on, 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 M uh, on MLB or NFL, Dot com, you see there's a large section now for women, clothing that is fitted for women. In other words, they're not just taking like a man's small or a man's medium for, for a little bit of a larger size and here, women wear it and it looks the same as a man. No, they have it shaped properly from a woman's, uh, you know, physique, a hat that is, you know, a smaller size, a little bit slight, color changes. Why? Because they want women to embrace the brand. Now, how are you going to get a woman to embrace a brand if you don't make it something that is appealing to them. And this holds true through anything. Um, you need to have the gear that speaks to them. And, and there's a lot of different sports out there that used to be dominated by men. For example, fishing. I'm an avid fisherman. So I've seen ads when they talk about professional tournaments, let's say for bass, bass fishing, they'll have female tournament winners, winners, people that win hundreds of thousands of dollars at tournaments. And she's advertising it. Why? Because she wants to get young girls and young women into fishing because that's something that she found to be um, you know so enjoyable and she wants to share that with people and it also helps the brand all the different brands Minkota, Yamaha, 
Shimano, all these different brands, you know, in the fishing world, they want to capitalize on this because the, why would they only want, it's to their interest, why would they be the only ones interested in men? Typical, because then everybody's going for the same demographic. You want to be atypical, you want to think outside the box. Let's look at exhibit 4.7, research design activities. Uh, activities, a question to be answered, type of research, what kind of research needs to be done. Are we going to do focus groups? Are we, going to, are we just going to get second-hand information? We're going to get information that we can find on the internet, stuff that we already have within the organization. Nature of the data, of course, what kind of data do we need? Uh, the nature of data collection, how should we collect the data? Again, are we going to do primary or secondary? Uh, information content, what do we need to know? Like, for example, in our situation with, with the female bi uh, person on the biker, uh, what, you know, what, her, what is her salary? And why would you need to know her salary? Well, because you want to build a composite. As much as we don't like the word profiling because it has a negative, even a racist connotation, but in a sense, that's what marketers do. They profile you. Not in a racial way, although sometimes they go after racial tendencies. They want to look at certain racial groups and how they behave and how they purchase. Um, some people will, will obviously brand that to be racist, you know, depending on your levels of political correctness. I'm not here to comment on that. That's not really the pur my purview here. But it is done out there. Right or wrong, it is done. Um, sampling plan, what should be included in the research, which is so important. Because if you don't know what's included in the research, how are you going to be able to do that research? Okay. The marketing research process, exploratory research, descriptive research, and casual research. Explore it, within exploratory research, if you look at the bottom here, I have, have it in front of you, clarify the research problem. Really, really understand what you're researching. If you don't understand what you're researching, then, then of course, you're not going to get anything valuable. Develop the hypothesis for testing in descriptive or casual research. Um, gain additional insight to help in survey development or to identify other research variables for study. Answer the research question. Let's talk about descriptive research. Identify the characteristics of our target market. Assess competitor actions in the marketplace and determine how much customers use our product. And it's very, very important. And also to, to learn the intensity of how of, of what they, you know, of how they use it. You know, is it something that other people using it casual users? Are they serious user, users? Um, discover, discover the differences across demographic characteristics, age, education, income with respect to the use of our product or our competitors. Casual research benefits versus costs before making any other decisions about the type of marketing research to use. It's essential to assess the benefits versus the costs. And as put simply, if the benefits of doing research do not exceed the cost, don't do the research. So you have to do it's like a cost benefit analysis. Is it worth it for me to buy something in the store? I gotta do a cost benefit analysis. The same mindset and the same way of looking at things should should happen, should occur when you're doing marketing research. Time until the decision. Decision makers sometimes have very little time between realizing a need for additional information and making a decision. When time is very short, a matter of days, it's simply not feasible to conduct in-depth marketing, focus groups, and all that because you need the information quicker, so you need to find quicker sources. Um, nature of the decision. The more strategic the decision, the more important. If, it, if your whole strategy hinges on it, the information, and the greater the need for primary um, data. Primary data is data that is specifically sought for that problem. In other words, it doesn't already exist out there in the open. It's something uh, that is already, you know, it's something that is specifically geared to what you need. So that's the nature of the decision. The more strategic the decision, the more important it is. And of course, availability of data. Companies already have a lot of data as a result of customer relationship management. And I'll give you an example. I think it was the Hilton. What they would do is to really impress their 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 frequent frequent flyers, they're not really frequent flyers, they don't fly, but the frequent users of the Hiltons, they would ask them, what do you like to find in your rooms? What what candy do you like? What drinks would you like in your fridge? And these people, these high high uh, priority customers would love it because they would know that they need the New York Times on their, you know, on their bed ready for them to read. They need a certain, I don't know, they like certain kinds of body wash or, I don't know, shampoo, whatever it is, the creature comforts that they need, or chocolates, this is all gleaned from customer relationship management. And that's so important, understanding what your customers want and need. Imagine you have a leasing guy that's been leasing to you for 20 years. He knows, oh yeah, okay, you just married off some kids? 
Okay, so that means you probably need a smaller card. All right, so let me show you what you could downsize to and you know what fits your needs, what fits your lifestyle. Establish a research design, exploratory, clarify the research problem, develop hypotheses for testing and descriptive or casual research, gain additional insights to help in survey, development, or to identify other research variables for study, answers the research question of what needs to be done. Descriptive research, identify characteristics of our target market. That's hence the name descriptive. Assess competitor actions in the marketplace. And even assess what you think, how you think they, they will react to you. Determine how customers use our products. Discover differences across demographic characteristics such as age, education, income with respect to the use of our products and competitors. Establish research design. Considerations are benefit versus cost, time of the decision, nature of the decision and availability of data. Again, benefits versus cost. If the benefits of doing the research do not exceed the cost, do not do the research, time of the decision. Basically, if it's, it, it, you, you know, you need to have uh, the information quickly, so then obviously you're not going to engage in heavy duty uh, research. Nature of the decision, the more strategic, the more important information is, and of course, availability of data. Companies already have a lot of data on their CRM and should use that data. We already did this a little bit. I don't know why they they kind of repeated themselves, but anyway. So primary data, data that is specifically sought for this information could come in the form of qualitative research, such as focus groups, quality. And as you're asking, and as it's not just how many yeses and nos, but you want to understand the yeses and nos and quantitative data. And of course, secondary data, data that exists already. Explan uh, exploratory research techniques can, can come about from a focus group. And by the way, you can make some nice money in focus groups. If you have some time off, you can Google focus groups in the area. They'll pay you for your time, and uh, maybe you'll even get your kosher lunch or kosher dinner. So basically, people that is, uh, it's a mo it's moderated. So focus group is moderated by a professional who carefully moves the conversation through a defined agenda in an unstructured, open format. And if it's too structured, obviously, then you're leading them to a certain conclusion, which is not going to give you robust information. Generally, the participants are selected on the basis of some sort of criteria. For example, they may be current customers or possess certain demographic characteristics such as age, income, and education, but they will all have at least one shared attribute to have some commonality. The value of focus group lies in the richness of the discussion and, of course, the, uh, the openness of the people. You, know, you have to have people that are willing to give good information. An in-depth interview is an unstructured or loosely structured interview when the individual has been chosen based on some characteristic of interest, often a demographic attribute of the people of the target market. This technique differs from focus groups in that the interview is done one-on-one -on -one as opposed to having, let's say, eight or ten people in a room rather than a small group. Same advantage and disadvantages are present here as with focus groups. Too. So research most often uses the needs to help formulate other types of research, such as surveys and observational research. Observational research can take the form of looking at uh, the camera, the security camera. There's a company, and maybe we'll do it tonight, I don't know if they still exist, but I know they existed in the 90s and early 2000s of Virocell. They actually analyzed um, video camera footage to see how people reacted. Because when you're not being watched, you act candidly, you act the way that you always act. And that candid behavior will help you, will help marketers understand what they need to do. Let's move on, almost done. So, descriptive research type surveys, you know, with surveys are behavioral data, include information about when, what, and how often customers purchase products and services, as well as other customer touches. For example, when they contact the organization with a complaint or, cust or question, uh, when companies match this kind of information with demographic and psychographic. Psychographic looks at the interests of people uh, and their lifestyles. They can, dif uh, they can see differences in purchase patterns. Behavior is usually more reliable and surveys because it's based on what respondents actually do rather than what they say they're doing. Say what you're doing is one thing, but to actually do something is more valuable to actually see what's going on. Observational data are the behavioral patterns among the population of interest. One of the most common uses of this type of research in relating retailers watch how people move through a store, no, uh, noting what aisles they go down and where they spend their time. Why do you think uh, even a small, tiny little bodega grocery why is the milk in the back? You ever wonder? So that 
Mother Gump go through the store because mm -hmm. that's what they need, and then they'll see what they sell. Right. There's a whole design. There's a whole chachman. There's a whole, um, you know, ideology, if you will, or a whole technique to how to design stores for that purpose, all driven by marketing research and consumer behavior. What informa information content? What do we need to know? A critical part of research design involves determining exactly what information is needed and how to frame the questions to get that information. Consider the structure and wording and possible responses. Questions may be open-ended, qualitative, like tell me why you feel that way, or closed-ended, quantitative, yes or no. How many of you agree or disagree? Strongly agree, strongly disagree. Like when you, when you give a, a rating on a course. Sampling plan, census, sample, probability, sample, and non-probability sampling. These are all statistical terms you learn in statistics. Just a census is a comprehensive record of each individual in the population of interest, while a sample, I say sample, is a subgroup of the population selected for participation in the research. You want to take a bunch. Let's say, for example, I mean, this is, a, this is not a good example, but just to understand. You have a polluted lake, and you want to know what level the pollution is at. So you would take samples, you would take air samples, you would take water samples, maybe you would take some rock and some algae samples and some frogs, some fish, randomly from random areas to ascertain the, the degree of pollution. And the same thing is done over here. You have a population, people you're trying to reach, and you want to take samples of these people. That's why you take a focus group. You have eight to ten people in a focus group. Those eight to ten people represent a live sample. Probability sampling uses a specific set of procedures to identify individuals from the population to be included in research. From here, a specific protocol is identified to select a number of individuals to research. Um, and again, this is all done mathematically. A called non-probability sampling, as the same as the name implies, the probability of everyone in the population being included in the sample is not identified. The chance of selection may be zero or not known. So when you're not identifying, you don't know the similarity or the dissimilarities. This type of sampling is often done when time or financial constraints limit the opportunity to conduct probability sampling. So in other words, it's, a, it's more random in nature. The most significant problem with the non-probability sampling is that it is significantly limits the ability to perform statistical analysis and generalize conclusions beyond the sam sample itself. However, I would posit that it's valuable for gauging a, an election. You wouldn't want to get all liberals and all conservatives to be in, you know, in a uh, in a poll for presidential, you know, elections because obviously information will be skewed. You have government resources for se secondary data, marketing research organizations, and the internet. Government sources, the federal, state, and local governments are important sources in collecting information on a variety of topics. For example, the U.S. Census Bureau publishes a library full of reports on business and consumer demographic trends. In 2012, the Census Bureau, which is a fantastic website, website you should definitely check out. Maybe we'll check it out tonight. Also has a lot of cool stuff about zip codes and know where, you know, which zip codes have wealthier people, poorer people, etc. Marketing research organizations, a number of market research organizations publish data helpful to marketers. One resource of many people are familiar with is Nielsen's. Nielsen's basically is the ratings, uh, they, they, they rate TV, but they do all kinds of other market research. And um, they have a computer program called PRISM, P-R-I-Z-M, that helps do marketing research. The ratings are the basis for establishing national cable and local advertising rates. Another service well known to the automobile enthusiast is the J.D. Power Automobile Quality and Customer Satisfaction Rankings, which you constantly hear in any auto commercials. While automobile manufacturers pay a fee for more detailed information, the public has asked access to overall rankings. Of course, the internet is now possible to access a huge amount of information using search engines, but again, you have to know how to search the internet properly. Collect the data, analyze the data, and of course, report the findings so important that it's done correctly. And marketing research technologies, online research tools, you know, the cloud databases, online focus groups, and online sampling. And again, the focus is online. If you look over here at the bottom, we give you all kinds of different companies that engage in these kinds of activities. Online focus groups, the virtual focus group, especially now with COVID, is very valuable. It's going to be a valuable and a viable alternative to the traditional focus group format, which is six to ten people in a room, offering a distinct advantage in terms of convenience and cost efficiency. Online focus groups provide data quickly 
and in a format that is usually easier to read and analyze and tabulate. Traditional focus groups require someone to transcribe the spoken words into transcript. With online focus groups, everything is already recorded by computer. It's kind of like when you do a Zoom recording, everything is there already. With the in increased use of mobile devices, it's even easier to conduct online focus groups and collect data even as the customer is experiencing the product or service. The primary disadvantage of online focus groups is that participants are limited to those with access to computer workstation. In addition, but with more smartphones, it becomes less of a problem. In addition, as people often participate remotely, it is not possible to verify who is actually responding to the questions. Measures can be employed to verify participation, for example, passwords, but the reality is in most cases you, can't, you, mu you must rely on the individual to be honest, which is something to be desired in today's day and age. One final problem is the lack of control over the environment. Traditional focus groups create an environment where participants are required to focus on the questions. They are being corralled in a room together. Online uh, focus groups, okay, I'm sorry about that. Online focus groups enable participants to be at home, work, or even at remote location with wireless access. Okay, let's just see how much battery life we've got here. 20%, we can make it. Let me just quickly plug in, sorry, for all you people watching this video. Just I figured I'd have enough juice to make it, but now the uh, screen went slightly dim, went into power saving mode, and it's getting harder to uh, read from the slides. So just bear with me, everyone. Gives this video a little bit of an authentic, organic feel. It's not scripted. Okay, so let's look at the next slide, secondary data. Exhibit 4.9 identifies the 10 most expensive countries for marketing research. Note that while the U.S. Ah, I hate these little interruptions. Note that while the U.S. and to a lesser extent Japan and, and the European Union are data-rich market environments, they're also among the most expensive countries in which to conduct marketing research. Fortunately, that level of information is not found anywhere else in the world. And in certain areas, such as Central Europe, this is, be, uh, this is because they have only recently moved to open market economies. In other parts of the world, such as China and India, culture does not encourage the free flow of information. And that's definitely true of China. China is very, very tight-lipped, as we can see, with how helpful they were with the coronavirus. I'm sorry if I've offended anybody, but that is the reality. They were not very helpful to us, and neither was the World Health Organization. Anyway, it thinks they, they were sadly mistaken. This makes it difficult for any organization, even governments, to collect good information. Let's consider three major challenges researchers face as they collect data around the world. Number one is data accessibility in the U.S. Business people are accustomed to easily accessing information that simply does not exist in much of the world. The U.S. Census Bureau provides information, for example, and um, basically um, gives you a, a wide range of detailed information, of course, uh, business sectors, including retailing and distribution, as well as specific data on many different economic and personal criteria, such as income per capita, per thousand, population by, con by county, and zip code, broken down by gender, age, household, etc. From government sources, U.S. Census Bureau, Department of Commerce, e EU Business Development Centers, non-governmental business organizations, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is a, good, is a rich source, and private research organizations. Data dependability. Second major issue is how dependable is the data. You're, you can only make good, good um, decisions if your information is correct. Can the information be considered accurate? Regrettably, in many cases, it cannot. Government agencies, particularly in developing countries, will distort data to present a more favorable analysis. The data are often reported correctly because the people do not want the government to know true figures, usually because of higher tax concerns. In other cases, governments want to present optimistic results that enforce government policies so they alter the data to reflect government accomplishments and make the world think that they are legitimate when in fact they are not. Typical of third world countries that are ruled by dictators. Data comparability, comparing the secondary data from foreign markets risks three other problems. First, developing countries often lack historical data, making, you know, especially if, if, it's, if it's starting to you know, have a resurgence, trying to get back on its feet. You don't have a lot of historical data because the prior regimes were definitely not anything you could track because there was no information. Making it much harder to assess long-term economic or business trends. Second, the availability of data are outdated, so they are ineffective for making decisions in the current economic environment. Finally, 
terms used in reporting information are not consistent. Standardized business terminology is not there, and that's a major issue. Our final slide is unwillingness to respond. Culture, gender, and individual differences create wide disparities in the willingness to provide personal information. The U.S. has an open information culture, and people are much more willing and more open to share, as you know, people put stuff on Facebook and Twitter, etc. But this openness is not shared around the world. So you have issues outside of America, because America is a very open culture, but that is not necessarily true in other regions of the world. In addition, government agencies such as the Securities and Exchange Commission require publicly traded companies to provide accurate business info, including valid financial results. Non-governmental agencies such as trade associations report studies widely used in business. The National Realtors Association, for example, publishes quarterly data on the housing industry that is considered an accurate assessment of the real estate market in the U.S. Unreliable sampling procedures related to the quality of data noted earlier is the problem of unreliable or inadequate demographic information to conduct primary research. In many countries, there's no way to locate or identify who lives where or even how many people live in a specific location because they don't, do not have the technology. Something business people in the U.S. take for granted in third world countries, you're not, having, you're not going to have that. In the U.S., sophisticated global positioning systems devices can direct people to specific locations based on maps and other data stored on hard drives. Consider the problem if you are uh, in a medium or small South American or Asian city where maps do not exist and street names are not even posted. Well, this is getting better now with Google World, but there is still an issue in a lot of parts of the world. So the lack of reliable census information coupled with inadequate infrastructure and, of course, inadequate technology to track things make it much, 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 diff much more difficult. China, believe it or not, they track you very, very easily through your cell phone. Inaccurate language translation, insufficient comprehension, Getting people in global markets to actually complete a survey presents three challenges. First, simply translating surveys can be challenging. For example, Chinese is written with characters known as Hanzi, each character representing a syllable of spoken Chinese with its own meaning. To read fluently in Chinese requires knowledge of more than 3,000 symbols. Talk about learning how to read. Second, word usage changes dramatically around the world. In the U.S. and Western Europe, family generally refers to immediate family units including a father, mother, and their children, your nuclear family. Your nuclear. I sound like George Bush, not nuclear. <laughs> While in many Latin and Asian cultures, family almost always includes an extended family, including aunts, uncles, cousins. So the word family has different connotations. Okay, so that's the end of this chapter. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a safe day.